And welcome back to TVD Week Africa, if you just uh, tuned in. As earlier, uh, uh, spoken between I and Anure, is going to be the topic on insecurity in Nigeria, role of identity crisis, porous borders, proliferation of arms in Nigeria. And with us in the house is Dr. Johnson Sunday Oche Wumi. Welcome on TVD Africa, Doctor. Thank you. Now, personally, I wouldn't want to waste any more time. Like I said earlier, I want to do more of the listening than the talking this morning. Uh, how does Nigerian identity uh, crisis, you know, including ethnic and uh, uh, religious diversity, contribute to the nation's current challenges? Uh, to start with, when you talk about identity, you are talking about means of identification. And looking at Nigeria as a nation, the problem of identity has really added to an insecurity problem. Nigeria is, can be considered from two angles when it comes to identity. Identity, identification. How do I know my role as a citizen in Nigeria? That is an identity issue. How do I know someone I'm meeting is related to me either by blood or by religion or by the state of the nation geographically speaking. That is an identity issue. But the country is divided by two major lines, ethnicity and religiosity. And that brings in identity crisis. Uh, looking at Nigeria, we have more than 300 groups of ethnicity. And because of that, we have not been able to harmonize the various groups in order to gain from our various talent and gifts. And what we see through the country facets is a situation where each person from different ethnicity want to attract attention to his or her own ethnic. And along the line, it, began, it begins to break us apart. Instead of bringing us together, and we are next different gains from different ethnicity. Mm. So it's a very serious challenge, and it brings in insecurity. How? In the area of ethnicity, a Yoruba man meeting with an Igbo person, we want to attract so many attention to himself, looking at the other person as uh, someone that he or she should not relate freely with. And when it comes to national resources, you want to direct those resources towards your own group and at the expense of other groups and people begin to fight on what is not necessary. Also, the ethnicity issue has also brought minority and majority. And you see the majority dominating the minority. And we are in the same country, Nigeria, where we are supposed to see ourselves as one. And instead of unity, we begin to see diversity. We begin to see breakup. Even within the same set of people, take for instance the Southwest, Yoruba, you will see Ife and Murakeke coming into crisis. And why the supposed owner of the land will want to make some claim over the lives and property of people that have come to serve as refugees at the initial stage in their location. And after a while, you will see those settlers also claiming to say, we both have this land. And before you know what is happening, it becomes a crisis. It becomes insecurity. And if a person can, uh, cannot freely relate with a Mudakeke person, and a Sekiri person cannot freely relate with an Ijo person, just because one group see the other as a threat to the other one. And we can go and go on and go on 
Still, still on, still on this table. I think to, uh, I like taking comparison from the past and the present because okay. I guess only then are we going to have a, a better result okay. when it comes to comparison. And in the days of um, MK Abiola, we understand a situation where he came out, you know, contesting and having. It was more like a Muslim Muslim ticket. In fact, it was a Muslim Muslim ticket. But uh, it's to the best of my knowledge, I understand that during that era, it wasn't something to be uh, talked about. You know, nobody really cared if it was a Muslim Muslim or a Christian Christian or Muslim Christian, it doesn't really matter, you know, to people at, at the time. But when it comes to our uh, present days, you know, uh, when uh, President Bola Metinibu came out with Shatima, it turned into a total uh, fiasco. I think to wonder, uh, is it more like the issue of uh, ethnic and religious uh, a challenge or crisis has been right from time, but maybe not as pronounced as it is now, or is it more like uh, is it uh, more like a recent or a newest development in our political era in Nigeria? Uh, looking at it from the angle of politics, that thing had been there even before now. But the number, the more we go in the number of years of our experiences that we have not been able to curb that threat, is becoming a monster. Okay. That if care is not taken, it may become something that we will not be able to control easily. Mm. During MKO Abiola period, the religion issue came in, and also because of his background, politically, economically, he was able to get more food from the northern part, religiously as a Muslim, and because of his uh, welfareism package that he had been utilizing even before he came out to uh, vie for presidency. That could be attributable to what led to his victory at that time. And also the Tinobu case, you will remember that it was a serious problem at that time. The Christian was shouting that no, it cannot be Muslim, Muslim. Mm -hmm. And some people even left his party based on that. Talking about certain part of the country. They move out from, the, from, from his party based on that fact. That is religious uh, deficit. Now, generally speaking, that problem had been there. And except our leaders are able, both political, religious, community leaders are able to resolve that crisis, then it becomes a threat to our unity. Mm. That is the way N I view it. Now, it's interesting that um, Ezekiel actually went the political way. And of course, from your analysis, letting us know that um, ethnicity and religion has become a tool that has been used by politicians to divide and share or rule the nation. Mm -hmm. And the citizens, like the saying that when the elephants fight is the grass that suffers, the politicians have assumed this big persona assuming the place of the elephant where they play their games and the citizens are the grass that actually suffer. Now, um, ethnic or ethnicity and religion attributes uh, has affected governance in Nigeria. And when it comes to state resources, this too is reflective um, you know, um, of um, the problem that has come out of these two uh, monsters uh, that are supposed to be good, but has turned into something very bad uh, for the nation. Again, talking about insecurity, um, the Boko Haram situation that we have in Nigeria can also, according to research, be traced to political problems that came up in the north. Yes. These people were asked uh, to help certain people win mm. the election. Mm. And after the elections, they were armed to protect and to ensure that the elections are won. But again, after the elections, other problems that came along with it they did not take the arms away from this set of people that evolved to become Boko Haram. Yes. So let us take a look at the genesis of insecurity um, in Nigeria, even as we talk about um, identity crisis, which evolved from saying.
If we look at insecurity from the angle of profilation of arms, there is no way we can cut that off the political scene in the country. When the politicians are coming out, most times they make use of thugs to do to ascertain that certain things are done for their own benefit. And as you have rightly put it, after election, those arms and ammunition given to them are not withdrawn. Even when the government comes out that those people should come to submit whatever you are having, how many people will come out to submit? These people were given money during election period, electioneering, and now after election, the money is not forthcoming and they are already harmed with arms. They will definitely go out. Then you begin to have records of kidnapping, banditry will be expanded, and so many other e social levels will come in. And the body language of the political leaders will be so strong when it comes to curbing insecurity in line with reducing the provision of arms and ammunition given to people. The leaders who have also utilized these people during election may not be able to do much in curbing the excesses in the handling of arms and ammunition in the country. To control that, our politicians will have to get a reorientation regarding how to go into electioneering process, mm. such that they will also be considered as being, in quotes, holy, such that they are not making use of these people to ensure that they get to the seat. Let the consent of the masses determine who gets there without making use of any external illegal structure to impose themselves on people. And once they are able to start from that angle, then it becomes so easy to control certain things when it comes to carrying of ammunition in Nigeria. And that will be able to assist in managing insecurity in the country. Still talking about um, identity crisis, I did mention state resources which are evenly distributed to advantage of majority mm. groups. Mm -hmm. This too has caused a huge problem according to um, discovery that um, when you share the resources of a nation on evenly, evenly. there tend to be problems especially when one part of the nation believe that they are the breadwinners. They, they bring the bread, they bring the butter, in terms of oil revenue and resources, as it were. But at the end of the day, yeah, there's this serious. general belief that the resources are unevenly distributed. This has caused a lot of uh, 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 identity crisis uh, that has led to insecurity, as it were. I, I would really want you to enumerate more on how um, uh, uneven sharing of resources has led to insecurity that we face in all parts of the nation today. In federal, in the principle of federal allocation, in any state where we use federalism, one of the principles is derivation principle. It means where you get resources to finance the central, larger percentage of that resources must go back to the land, the owner, the sector, the segment, the section that gives this, the sum of resources to the central. If that can be well managed, then it will reduce insecurity, particularly in those areas where we get our resources in the country. We rely majorly on oil revenue 
in this country. And we all know those areas where we get our oil from, crude oil in particular. And when we go to those areas, you will weep for people living in that place. In our constitution and other section of our governance, the companies that explore are supposed to do certain things for the area where they are exploring their oil. But in the country, in principle, those things are followed. But those things, do they get to the masses, the grassroots people, the community that are to be well taken care of? We are getting resources from that area. They are oil. The water is spilled with oil. The ground is getting deteriorated. The Agricultural river, activities they can't are fish. becoming another thing. They cannot fish. Then what are we doing for them from the money There are no good getting? roads. Uh, there are no hospitals. There are no schools. The roads are no roads. modern amenities. There's so cancer in those areas. Both companies that are getting resources from there on behalf of the country have certain things to do for them. And in principle, we learned that they are being done. But physically speaking, nothing to point to. At the federal level, yes, certain allocations go there. But one, is it sufficient? Two, do they appropriate accordingly for us to see that truly these things are going to where they are supposed to go? Sincerely speaking, derivation principle will tell you that you give much to who give you much. The percentage may be prorated, but much should go to where the resources are coming from. Then it will reduce the type of insecurity we are having around those areas. That is my own opinion. See, with what you just said, I tend to wonder at this point, just how much has uh, uh, historical grievances and uh, unresolved conflict over time tend to uh, affect uh, identity crisis currently in Nigeria? How much? Yes, has uh, unresolved uh, grievances. Conflict. Yes, and conflict. Ah. A clear case is a Uma? Namde Kanu. Humanly speaking, <laughs> no. I don't want to leave it up to me. <laughs> Humanly speaking, okay. Saruwiwa was killed mm -hmm. just like that. Mm -hmm. It's part of. I was serving when that man was killed. I was serving in Akwaibo. And, you know, we were sad. And the military manage that situation and the life of the man gone like that. Many countless number of stars that could have brought something good to this country have been destroyed because of community crisis based on identity crisis. I witnessed physically that of Ife Amodakeke. You know that one is indigenous and settlers and there are various types of that even in the country it's identity crisis hmm. i am not part of you you are not part of us we 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 welcome you here then you should serve us this way after some years i claim no i'm now part of you i own this one I've, our grandparents have been and before you know what is happening many lives we go many property burnt down they are countless. We are people are agitating for normal resources to be sent to their area. You will remember that lives have gone, properties have gone. And when you talk, when you talk, anytime you talk about life, anytime you talk about property, you are talking about destroying the future because the future is based on the present, the present is based on the past. So, what you have now, once it is destroyed. You have already ruined part of what you are going to enjoy in the, the future. future. Mm -hmm. So, humanly speaking, nobody can physically, but we, we can continue to enumerate, enumerate, and you can't count less number of what we have lost based on identity crisis in the country. It's huge, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, what about political representation and access to power? 
That yeah. is one point again in terms of political crisis. Um, it has become competitive, and but it has caused a lot of problems because uh, I want to mention here the divide of the Igbos, the Aussies, and mm -hmm. the Robos. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Igbos, the Aussies, and the Igbo, the the Hausa, Yoruba. Yorubas, and and the Igbos. Of course, we have other Ethnic. groups, ethnicity. If you put all the others, in quotes, into one bunch, they surpass this group that Nigeria has been divided into. And this is causing a lot of problems. Take a look at um, appointments in the nation. Um, it is reflective because we have people who go to school, people who are qualified, in the other Groups. sect or group that we, we will talk about. But if you, if you take a look at the list, the top choice uh, appointment goes to the north, mm. then it goes to west, the, the Igbos or the Igbos or the Yorubas, while the other ethnic groups are left unrepresented. I don't know how this has affected insecurity in your own understanding. You know, anytime we talk about security, it depends on the type of security you are addressing. But holistically, security, we talk about security of life, security in the area of food, like the one we are witnessing now, insecurity in the area of food, is still under identity crisis. Fulani people will come, I mean, let's say, the S men will come to say we want our uh, we want our cow to feed air, and the farmers will say no, you can't hit our farm uh, plants. And before you know what is happening, crisis will start, identity crisis. Now talking about majority and minority in representation. It's a serious crisis, political crisis in the country. We have more than 300 ethnic, ethnic groups, the three major ethnicity, Yoruba, Igbo, Aousa. Right from independence, we have seen the traces. And that is why a particular group out of these three believe we are born to rule. And because of that language, you see a particular, even amidst, amidst these three groups, you see a particular group relegated completely. And the other two, one believe we are to rule. The other one will say, okay, it is our turn now. <laughs> you better give us a slot. Uh -huh, that one will come. Then the third one, no space at all, even for that third one. <laughs> that is. Now, what of the other minor, permit me to use that, I'm not using in it quote, to read the Yes. Quote. Minor ethnic groups is a serious way of neglecting that group. And politically, we may have best people among them, people that can compete effectively with people from other three major groups. But we are unable to gain and tap the resources God had deposited into their life because we have kept them in the cage. We have made them to know that we can't hear your voice. We don't want to see you on stage. And Nigeria is not getting better. Because when a life has something to give to a nation, and there is no opportunity for that life to give that gift. You have denied that nation the blessing of that gift as well. And there is no way such group of people will help in the area of security. Even if they are not coming out to say, we make life unsafe, we make food security unsafe, but their own contribution to ensure security will be withdrawn. And any time you want them to also play certain roles, you will see them playing it in a passive way. And there is no way you can have a solid security structure in a country 
where certain category of, of people are not actively involved. You will see part of those smaller groups also coming up to form groups that we agitate. Even if they are not coming out publicly, underneath, you will see few of them. I'm not saying I've seen, but by theory hmm. and by what we have read before now, we have seen that such people can start sponsoring element of insecurity in such a country because they also have voice but we have said we don't want to hear you then they will also want to show to you that we are here so it's part of what is causing additional secure insecurity crisis in the country so when it comes to a uh, proliferation of arm and the spread of um insecurity in Nigeria, I think to wonder what role does porous border play mm. in mm. relation to this mm. challenge? Borders are our boundaries and we have four major zones in the country, north, east, south and west. And we are bordered by Niger Republic, Cameroon, Chad, Gulf of Guinea and few other ones. Now Borders are to be well protected by security structure formulated by our, our leaders. But when the borders become porous, it means the borders are not well, well controlled. The watchers and those to be watched are let loose. I don't want to go into what can make that be. But the question is, what are the implications on security? Porous borders. We make people to go in, to come in and go out unchecked, uncontrolled. And even if there are checkers there, when you say borders are porous, it means there are other areas, there are other lane, other path, other ways through which People can cross in or go out. It affords people opportunity to bring in anything, anytime. We have people outside who are not Nigerians. They can easily be employed to come in to add to insecurity state in the country once the border is porous. It also means I can go out there and bring in anything that I feel I need, and that can hurt to insecurity. And you Indeed, think our border structure in Nigeria is really nothing to write home about at some point? Uh, you know, you put it as, what are the implications of porous borders? And that's why I don't want to assess... <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I don't want to assess the state <laughs> of our borders. But we have assumed that porous borders are part of what will lead to insecurity uh, that is what i'm trying to <laughs> all right uh -huh. uh, at this point we, we, we have to go on the short break and probably we'll come back we'll go into the state of our border in okay. nigeria <laughs> so of you as you stay tuned we'll go for a short break and we'll come back the break africa continue <laughs> So, Zekel, that is um, the first part of our conversation for today. Um, it's interesting. We want our viewers to know that we have new things on daybreak for them. Uh, I don't want them to go anywhere because <laughs> if you're at home and you want to start a business, a business startup, we have something special on daybreak yes, yes, that we are bringing to you. Do not go anywhere. Don't touch that dial. Be right back. Welcome back to the Udo Break Africa. If you just tuned in, we're talking about insecurity in Nigeria, porous borders, uh, identity uh, crisis, political identity crisis, and, 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 and all that. And uh, our guest in the house, Dr. Johnson, was just telling us the state of, or about to rather tell us the state of our border in Nigeria and how somehow it plays a role one way or the other in the proliferation of arms in Nigeria. Please go on, Doctor. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not part of those people who are watching the borders. <laughs> but we assess it by what we see within the economy. Okay. There was a time during, don't let me go too far, during Buhari regime, all borders were closed against importation of certain commodities. Let me use rice as an example. But we were still getting imported rice in the country. That is a signal that the borders are porous. Embargo was placed on vehicle used above certain number of years from abroad. And people are still buying such vehicles, bringing those vehicles in. Through the borders. Through the borders. Through that the were, borders. That were closed. Aha. Uh -huh. That were borders supposedly that were closed. Supposedly closed. Mm. So we are getting those <laughs> materials to buy. They place embargo on flour, uh, imported flour. And we are still getting, import. they will tell you in the market, this is imported, this is local. And the borders have been closed against imported. Not two months, so that you will not see those ones have been in stock. Not six months, two years, three years, four years. Borders were closed against those items, and those items are found in the market. It means our borders are supposedly porous. So, and this morning before coming here, I read of a particular person that was caught with certain arms and ammunition. And those arms and ammunition were confirmed to be imported. Then what is the state of the border? It means that border is porous. So with what we see within, it shows to us that borders of the country, Nigeria, my country, Nigeria, are porous. Mm. People bring in things, goes out with those mm -hmm. things, uncontrolled, and one of the things, as an economist, one of the things that I feel may be responsible for that is low income of most of the workers hmm. who with little tips permit anything. Anyone that want to cross or you want to come in, you want to go out, most of these officers will just be looking for something you withdraw without checking on whatever you are bringing. Mm -hmm. And Top officers are not excluded in these things. My people are coming. <laughs> and so many other things like that. Our borders are not intact. Now, talking about our borders not being intact, um, the information that you spoke about, um, also today, this morning, there was a report of um, a young girl mm. that was actually caught transporting arms after a thorough search at the, uh, the, the checkpoint very close to a border in one of these northern countries. Um, it was a good thing that um, somehow they got information to thoroughly check the vehicle where they saw these um, munitions wrapped up amongst the clothes. You know, she gave the impression that she was traveling and she was caught and she gave um, a very good um, information to authorities for further investigation. Now, we all know that, um, uh, for example, the American uh, border with Mexico, we still have, especially the Biden administration, has serious problems with um, illegal immigrants crossing from Mexico, the Mexican border, into the United States. But again, when it comes to statistics, if by like, this, this present morning, you, you go for statistics, the American, uh, uh, the, the country is able to give you statistics of those that came in, those that were caught at a particular, uh, if not 100% in terms of immigrants crossing the borders, they can give you 98%, but we don't even have that. How serious is it for Nigeria to the tune or to the fact that we do not even have statistics mm -hmm. of people who come in and people who go out of the country through that our borders. That is a serious problem. Generally speaking, Nigeria 
is having problem of statistics. Up to now, we don't even know the number of people living in the country. We are still using population census of 2006 or so. And that 2006 <laughs> population was even contested by people. Number of immigrants, number of emigrants, I'm not so sure that we have that statistic. Though we have figures we record in the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics. But how realistic, I don't know. The one we put in CBN Statistical Bulletin, when it comes to population, net emigration, how, reli how reliable those who are compiling may be able to talk more about that. But recently, I had a person talking about trekking from Nigeria through the border, crossing to another country. Hmm. So it tells us of the porous border that we are having. There was a time during this uh, Boko Haram challenge, when it was so tough that time, people alleged, and we read on papers, of various borders through which people from other countries, I don't want to be naming countries now, cross over and that really hated the challenge that time against our security. So if the, com the country can get re realistic or reliable figure, then it helps us to prepare and plan how do we keep our borders intact. Then scientifically and in the area of technology, we still need to improve such that you may not rely on human being to checkmate what happens at the borders. So if the government can work on that, but it's an holistic issue, it cannot only work at the border, but it has to touch other segments of the country. But we need to put up strategy and structure that we keep our border intact if we want to improve on the level of our security in the country. Mm -hmm. talking, so, sorry, talking about this same data problem, we all know that um, then using Boko Haram as an example, that in, at the initial stage when it started, we discovered that most members were not Nigerians, mm -hmm. or when you even talk about the insurgents, that the incursion of insurgency into the country, we have people from outside, that is neighboring uh, Nigeria, people bordering our neighbors who freely come into Nigeria, perpetrate their act and freely leave. Now, talking about lack of statistics in terms of the number of people who cross in and those who go out, how can this actually affect our security uh, in the nation? How does this affect security in Nigeria? Uh, the lack first, of data. The first thing is, if we know the number of people coming here, it helps us to also strategically know the number of people that we need to put into a security outfit. You know, 10 people leaves your country, 100 people are coming here. It means the number of people in your country now have increased. The security, number of people in your security outfit, the various forms of security personnel that we have, you have to increase it as well. If it is ratio 1 to 10, once your 10 increases to 20, then the number of security officers must also increase. That is one. Then for the country to be serious about getting data of coming in, com going out, it means they will also be serious about checking what you bring in and what you take out. With that, to bring in arms and ammunition becomes a bit difficult. W once the country, I mean the government, increase and uh, add more value to, to border security. So 
it becomes difficult for people to bring in to bring in arms unwanted arms mm. it will be something that is legal that people can bring in at that point so that is how let me just mention those two areas mm. where the issue of security will be improved upon mm. so can you discuss with us probably the impact of uh, foreign interference or proxy wars okay. in um, in uh, on nigerians uh, crisis challenge okay. you know, on our landscape uh, you know anytime you talk about a particular country now we are operating at global level no country can say you are operating alone uh, there was a time we were discussing something and some people said, you know, external forces are even enjoying that Nigeria is not at peace. Mm. There is, any time anything is happening in Nigeria, there are certain countries that are interested. They are interested in the sense that if there is a crisis, some we feel that is market for our product. People will come to their country to buy more arms, more ammunition, either to defend or to attack. So a particular country may be interested. Hmm. If there is a crisis in another country, neighboring country, definitely there will be, if the border is porous, there will be influ influx of such crises into your own country and we can see that happening in those areas where we are having challenge currently mm. the neighboring countries are not also at peace men and women who run away from a particular country where crisis is ongoing entering into your own country if care is not taken they will come to that country to start another crisis mm. for that particular country. So if there is any country around Nigeria that is having a challenge, if, con if Nigeria is not properly guide guarded, then that problem will also enter into Nigeria. And you know, generally, there is a religion crisis globally and once that is happening any country that has an element of such religious issue is going to share part of it mm. uh, any global crisis will touch almost the countries that are involved in whatever that it's has originated on. the crisis that is what i'm trying to bring out from mm. there so we must be watchful when it comes to other nations having challenge of insecurity. Definitely take for instance when coronavirus started. It didn't start in Nigeria. But before you know what is happening, it entered here. So the same thing is applicable to insecurity. Mm. And any country that has large population is a target of war and threat. Once that type of crisis starts somewhere, another country that is big in the whole world is another target. Another country that is big is another target. Hmm. So that is... Okay. I wonder what now becomes the strategies uh, that can be implemented to actually strengthen our border to prevent this influx of... Uh, legality say arms and amongst other things uh it depends on the focus of our leaders at any point in time let me use Ondo state as an example when our late governor was there and he observed that certain things are coming into southwest he quickly briefed up the state's security outfit Though they couldn't say there was no attack, there was no crisis, but sincerely speaking, because of what he did at that time, and he maintained all true, it reduced the entrance 
of the crisis that touch other parts of Southwest. So in other words, not part. putting words in your mouth. Uh -huh. It's more like our government are mm -hmm. not really focused per se. That's what we are having, what we are having. <laughs> not putting words in your mouth, but yeah. is that what you're trying to imply is at some point? Yeah. Sincerely speaking, <laughs> once the government is serious about it, even if it cannot become zero, it will reduce very seriously. Mm. Okay, now talking about um, our porous borders, you can't talk about the borders without talking about um, inflow into yes. the country because both go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Proliferation of arms is as a result of the porous borders that we have. And we all see, like when we started, we talked about how Boko Haram started or how politicians use thugs to advance uh, their, their ambition. And after they get what they want, they do not go back to mop up these arms and ammunition that have been given to perpetrate their stay or their rise to, um, to, to governance. I, I want us to take a look at how serious arm proliferation is to any nation um, using Nigeria as a case study and how in your opinion this has led to the situation that we have in terms of kidnapping and of course insurgency every part of the nation is affected by crime and criminality or violence that has come up as a result of insecurity and of course the major weapons used are the guns, the bombs, and what have you. How has this affected our state of insecurity, in your opinion? In my own opinion, the background I will use to present our opinion is the state of economy. The state of economy has made people to look for anything to survive. And because of that, anybody around is looking for a way to get anything extra in order to sustain himself or herself. And because there is no proper check on who carries what, then people easily carry hands not that government has allowed us to do that. Government will shout, talk about it. Police will arrest you if you are caught with any of those elements. The people still carry it. And they carry it, kidnap, and ask for ransom. If government can provide suitable environment where people can easily work, get money for their three meals per day, comfortable accommodation, take care of their children. This issue of proliferation of arm and ammunition will reduce. Then level of corruption must also be reduced seriously. The other time we are talking about government not being focused. Sometimes government will release money for uh, arms and weapon of war for security purpose. But they will not monitor it. The money will enter into another hand. And that is how you will go. But on paper you will see trillions allocated for security purpose. If the economy can be proved upon by the government, if economy can be worked in a way that even men and women that do not want to do government job will be able to work under a conducive environment where stable light is, though we don't know what is happening, it's like improvement is coming <laughs> along that line, where good roads are. Where do they kidnap people? It's where the roads are not, are not good. Those kidnappers will stay there. They point going at, at you. They ask you to come down. But if the roads are good, you are on top speed. Who will come and 
hold you down. Everybody will want to run for his or her own life. So if government can be serious about security matter, but we can't leave the matter of security to the hand of government alone. And that is one other aspect of identity. For security, identity is necessary. If anybody enters our compound that looks strange, people in that area must be able to check who is this person, why is he here, what is he looking for. And interrogating such a person will make you to know more about the person. If the person is to be reported quickly, that person will be reported. So to improve on security situation in the country and to reduce proliferation of arms and ammunition in the country is a joint effort of both governments and individuals in the country. Truly. That is uh, my opinion. With that being said, I wonder what regional and uh, or international uh, collaboration are necessary you know, to mitigate this uh, challenge in Nigeria or West Africa at large? Mm -hmm. I agree with your opinion. If there can be regional collaboration, then the neighboring nations will become our watch our nations also. So no one will be able to cross from Benin Republic with hands and ammunition to Nigeria. And anyone who has done one half or the other won't be able to pick their victims and cross to another country. Successfully cross Successfully. Over. Mm. The same thing is applicable to Nigeria relating with other nations around us. Then, even for people outside the region, if there can be collaboration internationally, like the other time when students were kidnapped from one of our secondary school in the north, and U.S. was offering to come and assist in fixing them out. So, such collaboration will reduce the rate of insecurity in the country. I agree with you. you know, but many have this sentiment or this belief uh, rather that the government are not ready to extend uh, that hand, uh, you know, to welcome external uh, forces or external help. Do you agree with that uh, belief? And why do you think, um, if you agree, the federal government is shying away from getting international help, getting them involved in our uh, insecurity or security um, problems or crisis they are, we are facing right now? I may not be able to read their minds, but my own opinion is when you present something to me, I will sit down to look at the positive and negative. If I weigh and I feel the negative aspect of what you are presenting outweigh the positive, I may reject it. So there are two <laughs> ways to it. I don't know. From the Western world, certain things are presented as bait. Take this, we collect this from you. I'm an economist. When we had economic crisis the other time, 81, 83, 84, World Bank, IMF presented SAP. An economist then shouted that Nigeria should not buy it. But those people who do not know the meaning of SAP believe we should buy it. The government bought it and we cried for it. Because country that we enjoy the benefit of SAP must be a producer of exported commodities and not primary commodities. And Nigeria is a primary producer. So if what they were presenting to them for assistance in security happened to be bait, then I will agree with them that such should be rejected. But if it is for superiority that we can also do it, we can also undo it, certain times when it comes to security matter, you need external forces. Now, if talking about external forces or something that you said um, earlier, that um, war is highly lucrative. Mm. 
and if war is lucrative it should be lucrative for people who bring in the arms mm -hmm. and people who sell the arms mm -hmm. to Nigerians mm -hmm. as it were the question I want to ask is again before I ask the question um, there's a saying that um, Mongo Park didn't discover the Niger that there were Africans right here but they showed him the way mm -hmm. So, if they didn't show him where yeah, the River Niger was, he probably would still be going around in circles. We'll be reading Mongo Park in our story. Oh, Mongo Park is in Jeba right now, still looking for the source of the River Niger, as it were. We all know that war is lucrative. Talking about the solution, talking about mopping out the arms that we we'll talk about, how has Nigeria been able to find the source the international source from where those arms are coming in. Again, you did tell us that there are certain nations who fold their arms and wait for crisis in Nigeria because they know there is business to be made if war breaks out. Of course, we, we had a prediction that by 2015 that Nigeria will, be, will, will break apart. But today we are still together. Now, how do we mop out this arms from society? How do you think, in your opinion, as we begin to round up, how can the Nigerian government mop out uh, these arms uh, that are everywhere in the nation? How do we find the source from where these arms are coming into the country? How do we put a stay or a stop to this? Uh, where there is a will, there is a way. I'm not a security person, but with the little understanding I have, I know if the government is serious about mopping out, getting the sources of various arms and ammunition that are spread across the country, the government will do. But like I said, uh, like I said earlier, most of these things were also perpetrated by some of our leaders during electioneering process. So it became, it becomes difficult for them to also say we want to retrieve. But if they are serious about it, they will definitely do. Those who are in charge of security know how to retrieve, know how to trace source. When they get an arm, they know how to get where that thing is produced. And if they want to know who and how did they get it down to Nigeria? They would definitely... But we've never heard anything yeah. like that in the nation. And it's because it's because most of our people, leaders, are also involved. If they trace it, they will trace it to one or two of them also. Mm -hmm. So it's better they leave the matter silently like that and they pick whosoever they are able to arrest and leave it at that point. Okay, we want your final, your final say on this situation. Like you rightly said, um, it's possible that those who are trying to put out the fire are the ones uh, pouring in the petrol to ignite it when it comes to insecurity. Um, this is an opportunity for you to have your say on the situation, identity crisis and proliferation and every other problem that arise in terms of insecurity. What is your say to the federal government and, of course, to Nigerians? My final word is to reduce insecurity in this country. We must first of all see ourselves as one. Nigeria. I am a Nigerian. You are a Nigerian. Whether Igbo, Hausa, or Igbo, uh, or Yoruba. Yoruba. Also, let's give what is due to everyone. In our various regions, various states, various ethnic groups, let that serve them right. Let the national resources be evenly distributed. The rate of insecurity will definitely reduce. The borders should be well kept and we ensure that the atmosphere and the economic situation in the country is improved upon. Let there be job opportunities. Let power be made available. People who cannot get government job. We find some other things to do. And we see everyone. Any man that is fully engaged will not think 
of engaging himself in banditry, in kidnapping, if you have stable source of income, except that person is not normal. I feel with this, peace will improve, the situation in the country will get better, and insecurity will reduce. Thank you. Okay, if you just joined us, you've missed the entire conversation for today. We've been speaking with Dr. Johnson Sunday, or Jeumi, as a lecturer at the Department of Economics at Fuad Ondo State. He has a BSc from the University of Ibadan, MSc, OAU Affair, um, PhD, also from, the OA, from OAU Affair, and a PGDE from the University of Adoekiti. We appreciate you for being our guest on the show. This is where we draw the cotton. My name is Anne Rebenite. Stay safe and keep your hands clean. You do have a great day, Yarmin Ezekiel. Okay. Bye.